Today's topic of conversation is my review for the Formula One 2018 Japanese Grand Prix. It was a very early start, ladies and gentlemen, a five o'clock start on Channel 4, the coverage of this race over here in the UK. But we powered through it, we got up early, we watched the race and... I'm not going to lie, at that sort of time in the morning, I was a little bit sceptical on whether we'd be treated to a fantastic race or a bit of a dull race that, let's be honest, since 2014, since the hybrid era, Suzuka hasn't been the greatest track for racing, and especially last year where these cars are more difficult to overtake, it wasn't the best. But after qualifying, a fantastic setup for the race. I mean... We had a Mercedes 1-2, and even throughout practice and looking into the race, it looked like Mercedes were going to dominate, and I might as well just get it over and done with now. They did. They did, and that was a shame. But behind those, we had a great fight from third all the way down to pretty much P20, which is fantastic, and that's exactly what you want to see. And to be honest, even in those late stages, Bottas looked like he was struggling. So really, the only man that was untouchable today was Lewis Hamilton, might as well, like I say, spoil it now. Spoiler alert for the Japanese Grand Prix, but Lewis Hamilton has won his 71st ever Formula One Grand Prix and looks like he's wrapped up this title comfortably already, which is which is a shame. And thinking back to Spa when we're all thinking, does Vettel have this? Do Ferrari have the legs to really take this championship to Mercedes? Unfortunately for all of us, it looks like we're going to be finishing this championship with four races to go, which, let's be honest, I don't think any of us expected. But we'll focus more on that at the end. So let's go through the story of the race. Sometimes we go through the story, sometimes we go drive ride by driver. But I fancy doing the story today because there are quite a few spicy incidents throughout. So, like I say, qualifying. Mercedes front row lockout. Then we had Max Verstappen and Kimi Raikkonen. My boy Roman Grosjean representing in P5. A great quality from him. And then an even better quality from the two Toro Rosso boys. Hartley in P6 and Gasly P7. Vettel was down in P9. But because Ocon had a penalty from practice, he started P8. The opening lap. The start, not too many dramas. However, Sebastian Vettel into the first corner, all those first sequences of corners, managed to get all the way up to P6, so a great start from the Ferrari. And by the end of the lap, he'd also passed Romain Grosjean to get into P5. So a great start from Sebastian Vettel. Ricardo, who had an issue in Q2 yesterday, he started way, way back near the back of the field. He was slowly working his way through. But then at the very end of lap one, the first big story, the first big talking point, Raikkonen and Verstappen having contact. Verstappen, the Senna S's, runs it wide. When he comes back onto the track, hits Raikkonen, doesn't give Raikkonen any room. It's consequently given a five-second penalty for that manoeuvre. And this probably will be a controversial one. And I can see the Verstappen fans thinking that was really harsh from the stewards. David Coulthard on the Channel 4 commentary saying, that he just went back onto the racing line. I sort of see it a bit differently. I think I share the view of the stewards. I think it was a fair decision to give him a five-second penalty. He could have given room to Raikkonen. He could have come onto the track more safely and followed the actual tarmac runoff area. So for me, that one is pretty cut and dry. Five-second penalty. The more interesting one with Verstappen is what happens a few laps later with Sebastian Vettel. But that was not the next big incident that happened. A few moments later, further down the field, Charles Leclerc lined up a move on Kevin Magnussen. Magnussen, who, by the way, had an awful weekend all the way through, practice and qualifying. Leclerc, in the slipstream, bombing it. Bombing it right behind Kevin Magnussen. Like a bullet. He's going to fly past him. Moves to the right to go past him. And Magnussen does what Magnussen does best. And does an illegal block. A double move. Leclerc slams into the back of him. Leclerc loses part of his front wing. Magnussen gets a puncher. Absolute carnage on the main straight. How he didn't get a penalty for that. I don't know. This is the second race in a row that Magnussen has done this. The second idiotic time he's done it in a row. Not even this season. He's, he's done it constantly this season. And it goes under the radar. 
And today, to be fair, was one of the first times it's almost gone extremely wrong. And Leclerc, after that, was doomed to have a pretty awful day. Drove some... Well, let's be honest, he drove a really good race when he was actually wheel-to-wheel fighting with other drivers. But just, he just had the worst luck today, and it all started really with that contact, with that early pit stop to the medium tyres, which the medium tyres didn't seem to work at all this weekend. But Magnus, an awful mistake, an awful lapse of judgement. And at some point, there is going to be a major crash, and he needs to be penalised for these sort of manoeuvres. And I'm being totally honest here, I think the only reason he wasn't was because of the fact a few laps later he did end up DNFing. But Charles Leclerc, again, a strong quali in P11, didn't quite get into Q3. The race seemed like he had really good pace as well, so a real shame, well, it is a real shame that he wasn't able to really display and show his talent this weekend. But Magnussen displaying how stupid he is and showing everyone else why I'm not his biggest fan and probably one of his biggest critics. Anyway, we'll move on from that. With that incident, with the Magnussen incident, debris all over the circuit, safety car comes out. Pretty straightforward, then restart. Most of the drivers stay in formation. When we come back around for the second time, heading down to Spoon Corner, Vettel's got a beautiful run on Max Verstappen, but not close enough to make a move. But what does he do? He thinks he's playing F1 online. He dive bombs it up into the inside of Max Verstappen at Spoon, gets it all wrong, contact is made, Vettel spun round, Verstappen runs wide but he's able to keep on going, Vettel right at the back of the field and I'm sure you can guess my view on this straight away. I'm going to back you, Max Verstappen, you did nothing wrong there. Vettel was idiotic. Let's be honest, a little bit rash, probably because he knows the title's on the line and probably because he knows he needs to get maximum points and there's no point sitting behind a driver like many, well, like they don't really have much choice, the drivers anymore in these sort of cars. Once you get stuck behind a car, it's so difficult to catch and overtake. Vettel was trying to be opportunistic while in the early stage having that little bit more pace than the Red Bull, but it completely backfired. He should have waited till he was on the main straight, heading down to turn one. It was a bit rash, got it all wrong. And for me, that's Vettel's fault. But at the same time, Vettel was punished by the fact he was at the back of the field. Verstappen kept on going, barely any damage, so I think the stewards again made the right call there, which which is nice to see, and I've been very critical of the stewards this year, so it's nice to see that I agree with a lot of their decisions that they made today. After that, at this sort of point in the race, we had contact as well between Alonso and Stroll, Alonso fighting with Lance Stroll through 130R, Stroll gets the better of the two-time world champion, but then forces him wide onto the grass. Alonso, I don't want to say over-exaggerates it, but he then proceeds to cut the next corner, but deliberately cutting it and gaining a huge time advantage. Both of them ended up with five-second penalties. We've only seen the incident once, and it's not even in the highlight reel that Formula 1 put up on their YouTube channel, so it's hard to really analyse that one, but I think it was 51 half a dozen of the other, if I'm being totally honest, and nothing too much to report on a weekend where both Williams and McLaren, once again, were absolutely nowhere. At this sort of stage in the race, around that 14, Ricardo was working his way through and on that 15 managed to take away P5 from Romain Grosjean. After that, things started to die down a little bit. In the midfield, we had fights. Leclerc trying to work his way back through the Torosso boys, going backwards throughout the race. Gasly, though, he was trying to stick with Grosjean, but couldn't quite, well, didn't quite have the pace to match the Haas. The two Force Indians were trying to push further up into the top 10, and Ocon, with that five-second penalty, was trying to get back into the points. Lap 22 was when we were first sort of seeing some pit stops. Raikkonen was the first to come in, struggling on his tyres. He was then, well, I don't want to say jumped by Verstappen, but Verstappen then came in, was just about able to get in front of Raikkonen. Raikkonen, who almost was attempting an undercut, almost just trying to make his tyres last, do the best strategy for himself rather than worry about anyone else. But then Daniel Ricciardo, I went a few laps later, and both of them was also able to jump Kimi Raikkonen, meaning the order around the halfway point around lap 25 was Hamilton, Bottas, Verstappen, Ricardo, Raikkonen. 
Then behind those, we had Grosjean, who was still in P5, Gasly in P6, and then sort of a bit of a mishmash where every single lap drivers were cutting and changing their positions. And that was a real nice thing to see. And I've said all season that I love watching the midfield fight this year, and it's really going to close off in a bang. It really is. And in past years where... We've got to the end of the season, Hamilton's won it, and we've got those three or four races where we've just got nothing to watch, really. I think this year it's going to be fantastic to see which out of those drivers are going to get best of the rest in the championship and which team are going to get fourth in the championship. So that's a real interesting fight to still watch out for, for sure. So that was sort of the main focus around this halfway point. Lap 35, eventually, Sebastian Vettel was able to claw his way back up into that top six and pass Roman Grosjean. Lap 40, we then have Charles Leclerc finally going out of the race. He had to do a two-stop strategy. Those medium tyres, like I said earlier, were not working for anyone this weekend. And that's something I just want to quickly mention at the end. He seemed to have some sort of problem with the engine where we saw a virtual safety car, which is almost the last real thing of note in this race after the virtual safety car we saw Verstappen trying to catch Bottas but didn't quite have the pace to match Valtteri and then I will mention this obviously you know I quite like Roman Grosjean Grosjean was passed by Perez and Grosjean had made the claim that through the virtual safety car Perez had gained a huge advantage and we all know Grosjean loves a bit of a whine but I do have to agree with him that Perez did gain a hell of a lot of time throughout that period. I think Grosjean was about seven seconds in front of Sergio Perez. He was almost in a league of his own at that sort of point. But then Perez seemed to claw back a lot of time. And yes, he seemed to gain some time through the virtual safety car. And most notably, that was probably maybe the timing of the virtual safety car. Maybe Grosjean, went, or when it stopped, Grosjean was going through a slow corner or he was going through a slow corner before or on a straight and then Perez was going through a slow corner and then Perez was able to absolutely bomb it on the straight where Grosjean wasn't, something like that maybe. Or maybe there was a mistake or a glitch in the Haas system. No penalty. So I feel that's the sort of thing. If there was a mistake from Perez, the stewards would be right on that. So... Obviously, no issue on Perez's end, but maybe on Grosjean's end, he was going too slow under the virtual safety car, which we have seen this year. And it is something that earlier on in the year, Grosjean took full advantage of. Was it on Fernando Alonso? I can't quite remember. It was earlier on in the year, Grosjean did it to someone in Austria. Very opportunistic move there. And Perez has done the same to Grosjean this weekend. And again, Perez was on the soft tyres and Grosjean on the medium and these medium tyres, I keep saying it because it's so, so strange, they weren't working. They were not working this weekend. All the drivers were going to go on long runs, long distance paces on the slower tyre. But the soft tyre was quicker and lasted longer. It, it was very, very strange. And Pirelli are definitely going to have to look at that. Many blisters on the medium tyres, whereas the soft runners at the end of the race seemed to be going quicker than the guys on the medium. So it was very, very peculiar indeed. And it's something that they need to sort out because I know my man Grosjean's been screwed with tyres the last few races. And I know other drivers like Gasly and Hartley today, they were also screwed because they started in the top 10. And that has been an issue for the past five races or so, where if you start in the top 10, you're going to get screwed if you're in the lower half of the top 10 because the guys in 11th, 12th, 13th get free tyre choice. And that is something which you don't want to incentivise starting P11. You don't want to incentivise not going out in Q2. But if this is going to keep happening, like the Renault boys last time out in Russia said, you know what? It's probably better to start outside the top 10. It didn't quite work for them there, and it worked for them here. With Sainz passing Gasly with about three or four laps to go. So that's something that's really going to have to be looked at. But like I say, Hamilton eventually picked up his 71st win. His lead in the championship now, I believe, is 67 points, which is... Well, let's be quite honest. That is unachievable from Vettel. There's no way that Hamilton's going to DNF for the rest of the season. But I will throw it out there. You never know with Formula One. 
So there is still a chance. You know, Ferrari can turn this deficit around. And we have seen some incredible things in Formula 1 before. Raikkonen, when he won his championship with Ferrari, he was miles behind with about three or four races to go. So anything is possible. But it looks like with this win, Hamilton has almost secured his fifth world title and can do so next time out in the USA. Bottas did pick up another podium, his second second place in a row. Verstappen again in third. Ricardo. Starting way outside the top 10, ended P4. So Mercedes 1-2, Red Bull 3-4. Red Bull will be happy with that. Ferrari 5-6 with Raikkonen finished 5th and Vettel finishing 6th. Which, if I'm being honest, that suggests to me that even Ferrari themselves have sort of given up on the championship. And we've seen the past few races, Ferrari's pace haven't been there. It has not been there whatsoever. Mercedes, once again, look like they're in a completely different league. But Ferrari had an opportunity today to let Vettel pass Raikkonen. And I'm sure Kimi doesn't care if he finishes 5th or 6th. But for Vettel, those points at the end of the season could mean everything. And so the fact that Ferrari decided not to do that, not to make the switch suggests that even themselves, they think this is over. Perez, P7. Grosjean, P8. He, Grosjean, slowly climbing the World Championship standings after an awful first half of the season. I don't think he's quite in the running for that best of the rest, but he might be in with a chance of just about scraping into the top 10 if he continues his form he is currently on. Ocon, P9. as a great finish from him considering where he started, and Sainz as well, he had a really strong race, and he's definitely a driver I'm going to put in my top three for driver of the day. Went long on the medium tyres, went for a completely different strategy to everyone else, and it paid off, and that Renault car that's not looked great the past few races, somehow Sainz has managed to claw it into the top ten today with a really fantastic drive. Gasly, P11, he'll be gutted with that. His teammate Hartley in P13, starting sixth and seventh, their pace just faded today in the race and their straight line speed really didn't help that and starting in the top 10 as well that tire choice really destroyed their race Ericsson p12 a great fight from last place on the grid to get up to p12 alonso p14 van dorn p15 so mclaren's beating the two williams that's sort of positive but if you look back at the beginning of the season where alonso was fifth and the two Williams were out in Q1. Actually, no, they weren't. Stroll just got through to Q2. But they were clearly the slowest car that weekend. It's, it, McLaren and nowhere. I mean, if we're being honest, it's a real shame, especially for Fernando Alonso. And Stoffel van Dorn, who's likely to also finish his Formula 1 career this year as well. Sorokin in 16th. And Lance Stroll with that penalty down in P17. Despite also having a really good qualifying and getting through to Q2. So before I leave you guys... Of course, I want to know your thoughts on this, but I'll also give you mine. Driver of the day and my race rating. Driver of the day, I generally try and put up three candidates and then pick my number one. So my three candidates are going to be Carlos Sainz, as I mentioned. Esteban Ocon, a little bit of a left wing shout there, but a really there were, he did some really nice moves throughout this race and being able to fight back into that top 10 for a team that need as many points as they can get. I was impressed with Ocon today, but the man who's been on screen for the past 30 seconds is the man who's going to win my driver of the day. And he did win the overall vote, and, and it was rightly so. I don't agree that Sebastian Vettel was third on the, on the driver of the day. I really didn't think he had a fantastic race whatsoever, to be honest. I was quite disappointed with Sebastian, actually, today. But my race rating is going to be a 7 out of 10. Not the best race of the season, but definitely not the worst. It's almost, it's not quite an 8. Maybe that's because of the early start. Maybe that's more because in those late stages, the race did die down a bit. But especially in the early part, we have nice amount of drama, nice amount of action. And the Japanese Grand Prix, this is the best one we've seen for quite some time. So I was definitely thoroughly entertained this morning. I hope you guys were as well. Who was your driver of the day? What was your race rating? Put it down in the comments below. But guys, that has been Race Review. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.